Kerr. I'm Caroline McElnay and I'm Director of Public Health and I'm um, just going to give you an update on uh, today's numbers and happy to take questions afterwards. So today there are 12 new cases of COVID-19 to report, all detected in managed isolation. All have been transferred to a dedicated quarantine facility. There are no new cases in the community. Ten of the 12 new cases arrived from India on the 26th of September on flight AI1354 and tested positive around day three of their time in managed isolation. We can report that the cases were spread out throughout the plane on their flight to New Zealand, sitting between rows 14 and 41. We acknowledge that this is a high number of cases and it reflects that most of the rest of the world continues to experience high levels of COVID-19. This also re-emphasises why we have strong border control measures in place, including day three and day 12 testing, to keep New Zealand and New Zealanders safe. Of today's other cases, one case arrived from the US on the 26th of September and tested positive around day three of their time in managed isolation. And the 12th case arrived from the Philippines via Taiwan on the 23rd of September and was tested because they were a contact of another case. They tested positive on the 30th of September. There are 14 people currently isolating in the Auckland quarantine facility from the community which includes five people who tested positive for COVID-19 and their household contacts. We currently have one person in hospital with COVID-19, and that's at Middlemore Hospital. They are in isolation on a general ward. Since August the 11th, our contact tracing team has identified 4,047 close contacts of cases, of which all have been contacted and are self-isolating or have completed self-isolation. Uh, this number um, is, has dropped since yesterday due to our records being some records being identified as being duplicates in the system. Three previously reported cases are considered to have recovered, bringing our total number of active cases to 53. Of these, 42 are imported cases in our MIQ facilities and 11 are community cases. Our total number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 is 1,492 and that's the number we report to the World Health Organization. Yesterday our laboratories processed 5,679 tests bringing the total number of tests completed to date to 966,238. And um, the COVID tracer, there are now over 2 million users registered, 2,287,700 registered on the COVID tracer. And the app has recorded a total of over eight, 80 million poster scans. And users have created 3,475,327 manual diary entries in the New Zealand COVID tracer. And just before I, f I finish up and open for questions, I want to remind everyone enjoying break for the school holidays of the importance of staying vigilant to stop any spread of COVID-19. Please don't let your guard down. And remember, if you become unwell while on holiday, call Healthline, your GP or nurse practitioner, who can advise you whether you should be tested. If you're advised to get a test, please do so and don't wait until you get home to get tested. Please continue to sign into places using the NZ COVID Tracer app or keep a record of where you've been. This is especially important when on holiday because you may not remember all the locations that you've visited. And lastly, continue to maintain good hygiene practices including washing and drying your hands or use hand sanitizer if you're unable to wash your hands. Thank you. Obviously, you see that the 12 cases is a bit higher than what we've been seeing recently. What's, what's your message to people who might be a bit worried about um, hearing about that number of cases in one day, even if it's a managed isolation? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, it is a higher number, and um, but it reflects that um, if we get flights coming from um, countries where there is a higher likelihood of disease, then um, that's what our systems are set up to detect and manage. Uh, it is a, a business as usual process for us. Uh, the numbers do vary. You'll have seen that over the, the course of the weeks. Numbers do vary. This just reflects that we've had um, flights who've come in from um, countries where there's a higher level of, of disease. So I'd reassure the, the public that that's what our border control systems are designed to do. They're designed to test, uh, to have people in isolation and to manage those individuals. Do you know what proportion of people who have caught the disease coming into New Zealand are of India, um, came from India, do you know, roughly, since, since the latest outbreak? Uh, I haven't got those figures uh, uh, with me today, but um, we are looking at uh, pulling together data to assist with our assessment of um, high-risk countries. And we're also looking at pulling together the data on recent flights so that we can see how that, that matches up with um, the level of risk in those countries. Because isn't it the case that many of those uh, charter flights that they have already supposed to have been tested and found negative before they get onto the plane, is that standard practice for those flights? For, um, from, from India, from India, um, I'm, there's, there's, I'm not aware that they're, they're necessarily doing testing before boarding. They are checking to make sure that people aren't symptomatic. Um, but the, um, there are a number of countries across the world that are um, themselves looking at doing testing before people board flights. And where are those people in quarantine again? Sorry. Uh, now that they've been detected as cases, they'll all be moved to Jet Park. And you're pretty confident that the, the transfer process between the airport and the quarantine facilities is, is secure? Yes, so. yes. I mean, this is this is where we have to take universal precautions at all times. You just um, our assumption is for all anybody coming in to New Zealand is that they may possibly have been exposed to COVID. They may be already infectious or they may be incubating. So every step of our process is designed to make sure that people are managed from when they get off that plane to being transferred to their initial um, isolation facility. And then uh, while they're in that facility, when they're tested at day three, if they're positive, then the transfer, that all has to be uh, tightly managed, transferred to Jet Park. But of course, we can't let our guard down after that because individuals may still be incubating disease, they may be infectious, which is why we then hold people in isolation for the full 14 days, do another test at day 12, and it's only at that point that we can then be certain that um, they, they're COVID free. Have and you then done they're released after testing, that. And would that show whether they were more likely to have caught it on the plane rather than perhaps all coming from different households? Yeah, and um, we are doing genomic testing of all the uh, cases that are coming into New Zealand, and the genomic testing is really useful at um, helping us work out a chain of transmission. So uh, in this particular situation, uh, this flight, we wouldn't have those results yet. But when we get those results, we will be able to look and see if there's anything from the genomic testing that might suggest transmission on the flight. But our most likely theory would be these are individuals who were infected in, um, in India before they boarded the flight. When, when will you get that test done? Um, we should get that in the next few days. The genomic testing is now um, a, a standard part of what happens after people um, test positive. Their samples are routinely sent through for genomic testing, and that takes a couple of days. Do you know when the last time this many people were found to have been tested positive in, in sort of one day? Uh, office, offer, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. We Months can get ago, that. Though. We can get that information for you. We have had previous occasions when there's been. Um, flights who've come in with a number of cases. I'm also aware that um, because of the, um, the reporting uh, of the results, uh, they sometimes are reported on different days. That's just because of when they get reported. Uh, so this is probably the, the highest number just reported at, at once, but that's different to actually saying that was the highest number on a particular flight. But we can get you that information. Thank you.
Do you know what the requirements are for the crew on that flight? Because I understand um, they don't currently necessarily have to isolate or be tested at the moment. So the flight uh, for of the crew on that particular flight is an Air India crew, so an international crew. Uh, they were in managed isolation when they arrived. Um, uh, that is um, now the standard practice. So they were um, admitted into managed isolation and have since left the country. So for how many days were they in isolation? For? I think they were in for two days. So they were transported to managed is isolation and stay there and then they, um, they get back on a plane and um, they've returned back to India. And what are the chances we'll see more cases from that plane if there were 10 from one? Uh, it's a possibility. Um, I don't have the figures uh, yet as to how many of those people off the plane have all had their day three tests, um, but um, I've asked for those figures, and there may be there may be um, a few other that would be speculation. Mm. Um, can I ask uh, Dr. Caroline about there was two cases um, around uh, September 21st, which Malaysia recorded as imported cases from New Zealand. Um, and contact tracing, um, as the Ministry has said, as the two people were only symptomatic in Malaysia, um, the Ministry believed that any contacts in New Zealand would only be at a low risk, but Malaysia has continued to say that these people were imported cases. Mm. Um, is contact tracing underway? Will it mm. get underway for those people? I don't, ha I don't have the details of those particular cases, but certainly any time that we are informed of a case who's been picked up overseas, uh, we always uh, approach it on the assumption that they could have been a, an, in uh, an infectious case while, we, while, we're, while they were here. And... Um, we usually then do the close contact follow-up just to make sure, and then we get more information that allows us to say that, no, they, they weren't infectious um, while they were here. But I don't have the details of that particular um, situation, so again, we'll get back to you on that. Do you consider the Auckland-August cluster to be closed? We don't yet consider it to be closed. That's because we have a quite a formal and... Um, a lengthy process for officially closing uh, an outbreak, but it's certainly looking very encouraging. And um, hopefully we'll be able to report that it's closed in due course. What is that process to, to close a cluster? It's really a time-based process. So we look at the date of the last case and obviously after a while you, you begin to um, have a hope and expectation that you have seen the last case and then it's a matter of time. So it's, um, it's a 28 day period after the last case that was reported has recovered. So on the basis of what we're seeing at the moment, um, that would certainly be another um, 28 days before we'd be able to officially close it. So it's, it's, a, it's a pure numbers game. Um, oh, just on the India flight, so you, is the Ministry looking at uh, preparing any advice for the government on the possibility of free testing from high-risk countries? We, uh, we continue to look at all the advice that, that we give for managing um, people arriving into New Zealand, including people coming from high-risk countries. Uh, there's a range of different um, pieces of advice that we're um, pulling together. Um, that would include looking at uh, whether or not pre-departure testing would be a useful addition to what we currently have in place. So we are pulling that advice together. Because there are sort of rapid tests being developed up now, aren't there? Mm. There are a number of rapid tests, but some of those tests don't have quite the same level of accuracy as our PCR test, which is the one that we prefer to use in New Zealand. Um, it all depends as well on the purpose for testing before people uh, pre-departure testing. Uh, we would not want, or, or there would be an issue if we... Um, falsely assumed that somebody was not a case because they tested negative. We would still have to manage them the way in which we do at the moment, which is everyone um, required to go into isolation for 14 days. There may potentially be some um, uh, useful um, uh, if someone tested positive, um, but then we would have to 
um, the implication for the individual is that they would not then be able to get on board the plane. So again, it's about the availability of testing in those different countries in terms of whether it actually makes any significant difference to what we do in New Zealand and how we're managing the process. And I think what we've got in place at the moment um, is a very good approach to managing our risk. We've seen that with the number of returnees that um, we have seen uh, coming into New Zealand, but we can always look at how we can um, just tighten that and make it better, and that's the advice that we will be providing. Judith Collins is pretty determined to introduce that pre-departure testing. It, is it just too far-fetched if her, if her party was to get into government to introduce something like that? Well, I can't uh, comment on any um, p particular um, political um, uh, statements that have been made um, by um, leaders, but certainly uh, it is uh, looking at how we can constantly improve our processes is something that, that we as health officials um, will be doing. At this stage, though, could pre-departure testing improve our strategy? Pre-departure testing is certainly something to, to look at. A number of other countries do that. The countries that currently do that do tend to be countries uh, that have um, um, limited in-country systems to be able to deal with cases. I think New Zealand's demonstrated that we are able to, uh, to deal with cases. So uh, it certainly is something that, that some other countries are doing. So it's, it's worth us looking at how that would add to what we're doing here in New Zealand. Are the conditions there for Auckland to move to Level 1 and if they, that move is made, are going to be any changes to the settings around the rooms in terms of gathering sizes? I can't make any comment on, on that. That will be an announcement that the Prime Minister makes. Is one of today's cases, Dr Caroline, a baby under the age of one? Um, I'm not able to now? comment. I'm not able to comment on individual individual cases. Um, I do have those details, but I, I can't make any comment at this point. Yeah. Is, the no, ministry, no. Sorry, is the Ministry coming up with um, like a specific action plan for if there's an outbreak over the summer months, if there's less compliance in terms of staying at home, like what we've seen overseas? Mm. The Ministry, along with uh, the All of Government group that is, um, has been um, managing the response to COVID, um, we are uh, constantly reviewing our plans for any outbreak, any s resurgence, a range of different scenarios. That's very active work that's underway at the moment and, and will continue. And certainly, uh, the, the, you know, looking as we move into the summer months, what that would mean and what some of the challenges might be is something that we do have to consider. How is the Bluetooth card test going at the moment? And is it coming to an end of its trial? Has it been a good successful? Can you tell us? Any I'm sorry, I don't have information on that, but again, um, our, our comms team can come back to you with um, specifics on that. I've got a couple more questions. For the babies that, that are under the age of one or, or kind of in that kind of demographic, how, how are they tested and are they tested? Um, in general, um, they're not always tested and nor do they necessarily need to, need to be tested. I mean, um, the primary purpose for testing um, in a facility, uh, if that's your question, um, uh, is um, whether someone moves from isolation to quarantine. And actually, it, it, it doesn't really make a lot of difference because the, they're still required to... Um, uh, to be in, in a facility for the 14-day uh, period. So in a, in a situation with a baby, often if the parents have been tested and they're test positive, there's not necessarily a need to test the baby because it's just about whether or not the baby uh, you add the baby to the numbers or not. It doesn't change how you manage the situation. But if the baby's positive, would you have to test test the baby um, before they were to leave managed isolation? Not, necess not necessarily. And again, um, that's been advice that we've prov provided previously around um, an exemption from testing in order to leave is that uh, it's not necessarily for those young babies that, that that needs to happen. Usually the babies are part of a, a family group and so there's enough information then, there from the family group. Is, so is, last that, is that a risk though, if we're not testing? 
Um, it's more about the um, ability um, to test in babies and the, the challenges of testing in a, in a baby. And there are some other tests that you can do other than the nasopharyngeal swab, um, but that is certainly advice that well, we've had in place since um, our facilities were first stood up around testing of babies. And so, just last question. Yeah, can I ask one for a colleague? Uh, are you aware of um, sophisticated new modelling being developed by Te Punaha Matatini, and do you think it will improve, likely improve our management of future outbreaks? I'm very aware of the modelling that they're doing. They've provided a lot of really useful inputs into us. Um, and not sure exactly what specific uh, modelling you're referring to, but they're, they're very active in what they do, and we, we at the Ministry of Health really welcome the contributions that they've made. One final Great. question, Zara. I think final, final question. Just, um, so the head of the UN was talking about countries chipping in from their own funds to fund a global vaccine. Yes. Do you know if New Zealand is planning to join that call and... and, and Give some money to do it. New Zealand has already uh, contributed um, to the global initiatives around um, vaccine funding, and I, I think the Prime Minister made some statements about that um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Yes, but we're very much part of that global initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.